Hi. Hello. Well, good morning. I don't know what's going on with Zoom. I haven't used Zoom since like last summer, basically. So. Anna, hi. I'm so sorry. Are you you're good? I'm good. Yes. Thank you for your help. I apologize. I was trying to jump over to see if I could open, um, and it looks like we're there. Um, I, I can't see who else is in. Do you have others in there right now? Um, yeah, I'm seeing uh, Shelly okay. and Laura and Audrey. Hi. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's get this up here. Again, please be patient with me. I have not used... Uh, I haven't used Zoom again since last summer. Oh, oh God. Okay. Allow Zoom to share my screen. Last fall, Anna, when you taught my students. Oh, that's true. That's yeah. true. Okay. Um, man, Stuart, how do I go to the oh gee? You have to have the screen that you want to share has to be minimized on your screen and then you select it. So open it, minimize it, then hit share screen. Open it, minimize it. Yeah, you know. But, Click the one, the little one that makes it disappear. Okay. And it's still there at the bottom, right? Like it's showing me, it's showing, it's telling me that I have to sit, open system preferences, security and privacy to grant. Okay. <laughs> oh God. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> security and privacy. Okay, there it is. You know what, what about this, Stuart? Can I share this with you? And can you share the screen? I, I I'm can. so sorry, Stuart, can I ask you one quick favor? You just need to go in under participants. Okay. Um, and let me see if I can do it actually from here. Anna, give me one quick sec. Okay. I just wanna make you, okay, I think we've got that. You, sh you sh I apologies, Anna. I think you should now be able to share. All right, let's see, let's test it. it I think it. I think it's on my end though. So give it a try right now. I just reset yeah. something um, in terms of your co-host ability. You should have a share screen button at the bottom of your of your Zoom. I, you know, I do, I do. It's just that it's telling me I have to go in to my system preferences. I think oh. the, the quick, the quickest thing right now. I'm going to share this presentation with Stuart. Is that okay, Stuart? Okay, so we go to my Google Drive. Yeah, I'm just, I'm putting in your email, share that here, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, this is, this is a good opportunity to use those mindfulness skills. <laughs> you don't need to be frustrated. <laughs> and Anna, you're doing it with a smile. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things happen, <laughs> technology. All right, I think this should work. Give me a second. I'll share my screen and then okay. you, know, you tell me when to when yes, to move on you. and stuff. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, you got it. All right, got it. And then if if you uh, maybe if you could just throw in like the the slideshow, so we're not looking at all the. Uh, I can't do that. Stuart, see the see the um the yellow button in the upper right. It'll be the button right next to that. It says slideshow. Oh, got it, got it, got it, got it. Yes, I know. Yeah. I, I don't I don't don't use Google Docs that much. Okay, all right, all right, and you can go ahead and advance right to the next slide. Uh, okay, so my name is Anna Deem, um, and I have been practicing yoga and mindfulness um, in varying capacities since about 2014. Um, I've done a yoga teacher training. Uh, I did that in 2016, and I've taught yoga and mindfulness to um, to adults and to children. And mindfulness practices are a big part of my um, classroom environment. Um, so, Stuart, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. I'm trying to be very concise with everything, given this uh, slow, slow start. Oh, and actually, I didn't even know that was going to come up next. I have a monkey mind just like everybody else. We all have these minds that are pulling us here and there and everywhere. So um, that's, a, that's why I find mindfulness to be very important. All right, next slide. Why are we here? Go ahead, next. 
And then you can just write advance right through this whole little, I'll let you guys read that. I'm not going to read that to you. So how I am curious, um, I'm curious how you, the uh, participants briefly, how would you define mindfulness? What do you think of as mindfulness? Because I know this is kind of a buzzword in education. Um, so what are your personal experiences? Um, and Stuart, if maybe we could, maybe we could go out of the screen share for a sec. I would love to see people. All right. So does anyone, is anyone willing to, to share what they think about mindfulness? Well, I'll, I'll do it. I think it's, okay. uh, to me, it's about being attentive. I, I think of mindfulness as the opposite of mindlessness. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I know there's a million and one meanings, but I used to use an article called The Power of Mindful Learning, and it was just about, uh, you know, intentionality and in attention to what was happening as opposed to just doing without being there. Okay. Right. Yeah. Anybody else before we truck forward? 10 minutes late. <laughs> I think of it as there's kind of a non-judgmental nature to it as well. Just observing without judging right. how you're feeling, what's going on. Okay. Yeah, definitely. All right. And just in the interest of time, Stuart, let's go back to the slides. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I've got lots of things minimized on my screen. Okay. And go ahead and advance. So Headspace, a popular app, defines mindfulness as the ability to be fully present in the moment. And then there's a, a, one of the leading researchers in secular mindfulness, using mindfulness kind of in therapy. Um, he said that mindfulness is the awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. Um, so kind of a lot of what, what you all have been saying, um, paying attention uh, intentionally, intentionally paying attention just to the present moment, like, I, you know, feeling how I'm breathing, noticing what's around me, um, without having the mind travel through, um, kind of go through the patterns and scripts that it, it naturally wants to go through. Um, you can go ahead and advance, Stuart. Um, and this is him talking about this. Um, I guess we can, I think, let's watch this because he's a, you know, he's kind of the expert right now in secular mindfulness, so. Yes, I, I don't think I shared with sound. So give me one second and I'll share with sound. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I put in videos. Yeah, no, not a problem. The number of times that I fail to share with sound is <laughs> astonishing. Okay. My name is John Kabat-Zinn. My working definition, or what I call operational definition of mindfulness is it's the awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And then I sometimes say, in the service of self-understanding and wisdom. We all take ourselves too seriously because we believe that there is someone to take seriously. That me, we become the star of our own movie, uh, the story of me, starring, of course, me. And everybody else becomes a bit player in our movie. And then we forget that it's a fabrication, it's a construction, and that it's not a movie, and that there's no you that you can actually find if you were to sort of start to peel back. Well, are you your name? Are you your age? Are you your thoughts? Are you your opinions? Are you your, even your genetic inheritance? Uh, even your genes, if you meditate or eat differently, they're going to be expressed by the hundreds differently. So you're not even your genetic inheritance. So who are you? And here's where the rubber really meets the road. The question is much more important than the dime store answers that we come up with. So then we can notice this phenomenon called selfing. How much of our time we are running the narrative of I, me, and mine, which is now being identified with certain regions of the brain that do that narrative default mode kind of thing. And then mindfulness MBSR has been shown to actually light up other areas or more lateral areas where there's no more story of me. It's just 
this breath, that out breath, and, and it's not me breathing either. If it was up to me to have be breathing, I would have died a long time ago. Whoops, got distracted, forgot, dead. Okay, so that's kind of the, you know, his secular definition of what mindfulness is. Um, and something I find, you can go ahead and advance the slide, Stuart. Something that I find, um, you know, also very appealing about mindfulness is that it can be um, completely secular or, uh, you know, for different people's um, preferences, it can oh, be sorry. totally tied. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I know, that's okay. It always does that. <laughs> yeah. Um, it can also be tied to, you know, people's various religious practices. So this is um, a late monk, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who, if you are interested in all, at all um, in learning more about, um, well, I mean, he, you know, he's in, in Buddhism, whatever. He died this past year, but he has many beautiful, beautiful um, talks. And he, he says something similar. So, you know, in the kind of, you know, not religious, but spiritual realm, as well as the secular realm realm, um, we kind of have similar definitions of mindfulness. So you can go ahead and advance the slide. Sorry, trying to really speed through this. So our, our minds wander, our minds are existing in that default mode network about 50% of the time. So the like, ha at least half the time, we're not really anchored in the present moment. You can go ahead and advance. Um, so our, our body is here in the present moment, but we our mind is typically existing in these kind of negative states. You know, we're, we're ruminating about something we're worried about. Uh, we're thinking about regrets. We're concerned about what's going to happen in the future. Um, and we're not often just noticing what's happening in the now. So using we can use mindfulness in order to train our minds in, with certain anchors so that when we notice oh my you know i am concerned i'm worried about some deadline or i'm kind of ruminating i'm uh i'm regretting something that happened in the past when we recognize like that's where my mind is then by training these mindfulness anchors then we can kind of bring it back um and in bringing our mind back to the present moment, none of those things that we're ruminating about, none of the things that we're worried about in the future, none of those things are happening now. And so we're more able to like deal with those things, you know, or, or make decisive action, make choices when we are kind of centered in the present moment. You can advance, please. Thank you. Uh, so like I was saying, we can train our attention and uh, go ahead and advance again. So this is kind of like this cycle that happens when you're um, practicing meditation. If you practice meditation, or even if you practice just a few minutes of um, mindfulness, you can notice like, oh, wow, in trying to focus on my breath for just a couple of minutes, my mind is already starting to wander here and there. Um, so this is the natural thing. It naturally wanders. And then as we practice, we become better at like noticing when it's starting to wander. So that moment of noticing is like the, that is the practice. That is the moment. So when I notice, okay, so, you know, I'm doing my mindfulness exercise and I notice, oh, my, I'm thinking about tomorrow. Okay. So now that I've noticed, now I have the power to choose and to identify what has pulled my attention out of the present moment. And then I can also choose to return into the present moment and choose to focus my attention as I as I wish. Um, and then of course, naturally the mind will wander again because that's what brains do. They just, they wander. Um, and so, and so the more that I do these practices, the more that I sit in meditation for one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, the more opportunity opportunities I have to catch my mind wandering out of the present moment and then make the choice to bring it back. And what that ends up precipitating out into is like, okay, now when I'm in a stressful moment, if I've been practicing this kind of in the calm of my home, whatever, in the calm of my classroom, now I'm actually in a stressful moment and I'm having a hard time regulating myself. Well, if I've developed this practice of like, um, of, of noticing where my mind is going to, then I am more able in the moment when I'm stressed to say, oh, okay, I know how to do this and then choose one of the anchors that works well for me. So, you know, for me personally, it would be really just taking a couple of deep breaths, you know? So if I'm noticing that I'm all out of the present moment, I'm frazzled, whatever, just taking a deep breath can help to bring me back. And the practice is 
recognizing when to use that anchor, recognizing when I need to bring myself back. Uh, okay, go ahead, advance, please. Why is it important? What are some of the benefits? Let's see. Uh, next slide. Decrease stress, physical health, uh, enhance job performance, decrease anxiety, depression, worry, rumination, all great things. Uh, go ahead and to, to the next one. Those are benefits for adults and children. Um, and then for, for kids in the classroom, uh, you know, it's going to help them having this kind of practice or having some awareness of this is going to help them to achieve. Um, it can really help with those students who have some of the um, more intense behaviors. Um, if you can train them, you know, or if you can get them to know like, oh man, when I take that deep breath, it does actually calm my body down a little bit. Um, you know, if you, and one thing that I use in the classroom is whenever we do deep breaths together, I'll pair it with some sort of hand signal. So then if a student is getting dysregulated, you can just do that and it can help them to recognize, oh yeah, okay, I, I am getting dysregulated. This is uncomfortable. I can take a breath. Um, but unless they have the experience with that, you know, uh, actually uh, in their own body, you know, that you're not going to really, then they're going to be like, oh, take a breath. Oh, that's dumb. Um, so yeah, increased emotional regulation and self-control, improved social and relational skills. All of these things definitely come from cultivating these mindfulness practices in the classroom. Okay. And now let's, let's get on to what some of them are. So if you are interested at all in doing this in your classroom or at your school, um, that's advanced. I'm going to, let's just skip that one for right now. Um, so a couple of, a couple of just very simple things. I think this can be done in elementary and it can also be done in high school. I have a friend who's a high school teacher and he says he starts like the first minute, two minutes of every class running his students through, uh, like quick mindfulness exercise exercise. And, you know, high schoolers, teenagers, they can be like, oh, you know, <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. But he'll tell them, just just pretend no one will even know if you're doing it or not. So then if they're if they're just even able to, uh, you know, kind of quiet down, put down their phones for that amount of time just to pretend, then surprise, they may end up actually doing it without even realizing that they're doing it. Okay. Um, so a couple of a couple of these, um, let's see, one that I'll just hit on a couple that I find really uh, beneficial um, the body scan where you talk about just kind of going from the head, you know, down to the shoulders, through the arms and hands. And if you lead kids through this using, um, talking about like the sun and having the, the sun warming the different parts of the body, this is a great way to have, uh, children start developing kind of like awareness of the, like really imagining and visualizing the different parts of their body. Um, another one I love is, um, you know, using a chime in order to call the kids attention. Um, you know, you can also do this in sort of like, a, okay, we're all circled up on the carpet. I'm going to ring the chime. Just put your thumb up when you can't hear the chime anymore. So in order to do that, of course, we all have to be very quiet. We all have to focus our attention um, really strongly on the sound. Um, and they love this and they'll definitely do this. And then it also helps for when you're using that as an attention getter, because <laughs> we'll all be like, oh, I'm listening. When, when will it stop? Um, the the copycat game this is something that they might you know you do and like kind of dance um you know where it's like you are standing across from a partner and you need to pretend that you're mirrors but in order to do that you have to really be kind of tuned in to what the other person is doing um and then oh man i like all of these and then the belly breathing this is a great one if you just because a lot of kids you'll notice even when you tell them to take a deep breath they'll like puff up their chest, you know, and their stomach will actually go in. <laughs> but uh, in my classroom lately, we've been really, we've been practicing this a lot, like turning our bellies into balloons. And if you, if you even take a second to do that, like actually taking a full breath, it like immediately after one breath, two breaths, three breaths, I can immediately feel like a sense of calm through my body. So getting the kids to do those belly balloon breaths, very, very effective. Uh, okay, next slide. <laughs> A couple more, uh, you know, kind of doing arm squeezes and then kind of this, another sort of dance kind of exercise, you know, or like kind of tapping down the arm, like doing these kinds of things. And then the rainstorm, you can watch videos of this. This this 
I have the kids sit in a circle and they go through the motions and it's like, I change, then the next person, the next person, we all change around in a circle. Then we go to the next action, change around in a circle. Um, and so then we end up spending like a couple of minutes even like really focused on the person in front of us and really focused on the sound of the rainstorm. This is great activity. I'm sure you've probably heard of it, but uh, Google a video and you can very easy to do in a classroom. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Um, these are a couple of resources that I have found to be super duper helpful. Um, Yoga for Classrooms actually was recommended to me by uh, Tabitha Delangelo uh, in one of my TCNJ classes. And um, these cards have, there's like all the way from very active like yoga type moves to guided meditation. So if you don't have a lot of experience yourself with this, you can just read through that card um, and it will tell you everything you need to know. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll put some of these cards up. And then when we're going to do, uh, when we're going to do an activity, a yoga activity or a mindfulness activity, students can choose like, what do we need right now? What's going to help us right now? Um, so then it starts to build their autonomy with it as well. And it helps them to recognize like, okay, does my body need, or does this activity call for like building energy or does this activity call for bringing our energy down? Um, and then I, I included Insight Timer and Headspace on here because I think that it's very, and these two books as well, because <laughs> on the next slide, because I think one thing about mindfulness is that schools are definitely like pushing this buzzword of mindfulness. Um, but I really do believe that in order to effectively um, give this to students, in order to effectively um, share like the power of mindfulness with them it is i think important to have some experience yourself as an adult um and the apps insight timer is completely free um and there's hundreds of thousands of guided meditations and headspace is a little bit more guided where they'll have like courses so you know the kind of whatever skill you want to develop you go through their different courses um and there's varying lengths varying uh themes um, and they're, I think they're super effective in giving kind of that um, baseline knowledge of mindfulness and helping you to start practice that the practice of coming back to um, the center. For me, when I first was told about mindfulness, I was like, oh my gosh, um, you know, it sounds too religious for me, like when I first heard it. Or I think some people might think, oh, it sounds a little bit too hippy dippy. So I included some of these books here, which are specifically targeted at those who may have those feelings um, that can kind of give you the, the very secular view of, um, of this practice. Okay, next slide. I have like one more thing <laughs> to say. Okay, um, the most, the most for, for me, uh, kind of my, the thing that I am most proud of in my classroom is this time called moments of peace where I have the kids, it's after recess, we come in um, and everybody sits around the perimeter of the carpet and there's a peace leader who will lead us in three breaths um, and then she'll, or he or she will then ring the, um, or they will then ring the bell or ring my singing bowl. Everybody will lie down. Um, and we'll go through one of these guided meditations and people will say like, no, there's no way that kids, you know, they, they're, they're not going to settle down, whatever. But when I, when I was a long-term sub um, and I just came into a classroom, so I was using here, here, this card, that card, you know, and occasionally we would do one of these guided meditations. And then eventually I got, you know, maybe a month into being with this class that I was doing a long-term sub job with. I started letting them choose which card that we would do during this kind of yoga time after recess instead of the full moments of peace. And every single day, the, the kid who was choosing would choose one of the guided meditations. And I, I'm not going to say that there doesn't need to be some setup. You know, you're not talking, you're not touching. There doesn't, of course, there needs to be um, some of the setup. But once the kids had that experience of feeling what it feels like for their body to kind of come back to that relaxed space, they will ask for it. Genuinely, they will ask for it. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's very powerful. Um, and maybe perhaps if, if these slides could be shared each, oh, well, I guess people would have to have, I did, I was hoping that we would have time to be able to go through kind of a brief body scan on my Headspace account. Um, but it seems that we don't have time for that with the technical difficulties, but um, I, you know, I hope, I hope that you all enjoyed the abbreviated version of my presentation and I found mindfulness to be a super powerful tool and I hope that um, I've at least piqued your in interest a little bit, so.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry it started late for you. Oh, it's okay. It happens. It's really not a big deal. <laughs> I still got a couple ideas to steal. Like, like I'm doing a presentation later today and, I, and I'm using like two of your ideas. So uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, well, great. <laughs> great. I'll try, to great. I'll, I'll try to remember to credit you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and I posted, I posted another book in the chat if anyone's interested. Oh, great. Great. I, I am definitely interested, always interested in new resources. Thank you. Thank All you so right. much. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anna. I have, I have to run out of because I'm going to a 15 minute one. So I, I have to be there. So, um, but thank you. That was great. And I'm so sorry. With the it's, I mean, it's really okay. It was fun to do. And yeah. my, my principal now, she was like, save the presentation. Maybe you can do it at one of our like superintendents conference days. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should. It's a great presentation. And you can All build right. in more stuff. Yeah. Awesome. It was good. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Yeah, bye. Bye -bye. Thanks.